nationalisme, c'est la guerre. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to you, our audience, and our special speakers. This program tonight is titled Europa, Wir schaffen das. And this program is part of the second edition of the Forum on European Culture. This year's theme is Act for Democracy. For four days, thinkers, artists, journalists, and politicians from all over the world are gathered here in Amsterdam to discuss Europe's challenges and Europe's future at a crucial point in European history. The Forum is an initiative of the Bali and Dutch culture, and tonight we will speak about Germany and Europe, identity and culture, and um, that brings us immediately into a dilemma, because the evening consists of several performances from a very beautiful Dutch performer who will perform in Dutch and in German. Uh, we have a, a performance from a very famous German actor who will perform in German. And we will have uh, two keynotes who will be in German and English, uh, and a panel in English. So uh, that is um, quite the example of a European experience tonight. Uh, if you, you, if you, you, you lack the ability to speak German, don't worry, uh, because there will be s a, a subtitling or above titling uh, during the speeches and uh, performances. Um, we will start this evening with a very special performer from the Netherlands, Then, She is a theatre performer, um, singer-songwriter, actress, producer, and she's the artist in residence at Carré, a theatre here in Amsterdam. And she currently tours through our country with her new album, Mens, which is her first Dutch album. For tonight, we asked Wende to select some songs that relate to the theme of the evening, the role of Germany in Europe. And during the evening, she will perform several songs. We're so happy that she's here. Um, and uh, after her introduction, so it's a musical introduction to this theme, we will watch the performance of one of the Germ Germany's most important actors of today, Lars Eidinger. It's an evening full of performance, theatre, music and debate keynotes, but we'll start with Wende. She will perform a song uh, from Rio Reiser, Dahin. Give her a very big welcome to the stage, Wende. Stille Nacht, die goldene Zeit, der wilde Bach, das fremde Land, der Lindenbaum, ein müde Wand. Sommertraum Dahin, dahin Vorbei, vorbei Der lange Weg Die kurze Rast Ein 
Um, as I already mentioned, the second performance of tonight is a performance of Lars Eidinger, who will read an important text from Europe, Europe's, uh, German's literature, well, European literature, selected by our first keynote spe speaker, Seran Atesh. And you can find a transla translation on uh, the text on the, s of the, on the screen, and uh, the text is uh, Die Ring Parabel. Give him a warm welcome. Die Ringparabel. Gotthold Ephraim Lessing. Vor grauen Jahren lebt ein Mann in Osten der einen Ring von unschätzbarem Wert aus lieber Hand besaß. Der Stein war ein Opal, der hundert schöne Farben spielte und hatte die geheime Kraft, vor Gott und Menschen angenehm zu machen, wer in dieser Zuversicht ihn trug. Was Wunder, dass ihn der Mann in Osten darum nie vom Finger ließ und die Verfügung traf, auf ewig ihn bei seinem Hause zu erhalten. Nämlich so, er ließ den Ring von seinen Söhnen, den Geliebtesten, und setzte fest, dass dieser wiederum den Ring von seinen Söhnen dem vermache, der ihm der Liebste sei und stets der Liebste, ohne Ansehen der Geburt, in Kraft allein des Rings, das Haupt, der Fürst des Hauses werde. So kam nun dieser Ring von Sohn zu Sohn auf einen Vater endlich von drei Söhnen, die alle drei ihm gleich gehorsam waren, die alle drei erfolglich gleich zu lieben, sich nicht entbrechen konnte. Nur von Zeit zu Zeit schien ihm bald der, bald dieser, bald der Dritte, so wie jeder sich mit ihm allein befand und sein ergießend Herz die anderen zwei nicht teilten, würdiger des Ringes. 
den er dann auch einem jeden die fromme Schwachheit hatte, zu versprechen. Das ging nun so, solange es ging. Allein es kam zum Sterben und der gute Vater kümmt in Verlegenheit. Es schmerzt ihn, zwei von seinen Söhnen, die sich auf sein Wort verlassen, so zu kränken. Was zu tun? Er sendet in Geheim zu einem Künstler, bei dem er nach dem Muster seines Ringes zwei andere bestellt und weder Kosten noch Mühe sparen heißt, sie jenem gleich vollkommen gleich zu machen. Das gelingt dem Künstler. Da er ihm die Ringe bringt, kann selbst der Vater seinen Musterring nicht unterscheiden. Froh und freudig ruft er seine Söhne jeden ins Besondere, gibt jedem insbesondere seinen Segen und seinen Ring und stirbt. Kaum war der Vater tot, so kömmt ein jeder mit seinem Ring und jeder will der Fürst des Hauses sein. Man untersucht, man zankt, man klagt, umsonst. Der rechte Ring war nicht erweislich, fast so unerweislich, als uns itzt der rechte Glaube. Wie gesagt, die Söhne verklagten sich und jeder schwur dem Richter unmittelbar aus seines Vaters Hand, den Ring zu haben, wie auch war. Nachdem er ihn von lange das Versprechen schon gehabt, des Ringes Vorrecht einmal zu genießen, wie nicht minder war. Der Vater, beteuerte jeder, könne gegen ihn nicht falsch gewesen sein und ehe er dieses von ihm, von einem solchen lieben Vater, arg wohnen las, ehe müsse er seine Brüder so gern er sonst von ihnen nur das Beste bereit zu glauben sei, des falschen Spiels bezeihen und er wolle die Verräter schon auszufinden wissen, sich schon rächen. Der Richter sprach, wenn ihr mir nun den Vater nicht bald zur Stelle schafft, so weiß ich euch von meinem Stuhle. Denkt ihr, dass ich Rätsel zu lösen da bin? Oder harret ihr, bis dass der rechte Ring den Mund eröffne? Doch halt, ich höre ja, der rechte Ring besitzt die Wunderkraft, beliebt zu machen, vor Gott und Menschen angenehm. Das muss entscheiden, denn die falschen Ringe werden es doch nicht können. Nun, wen lieben zwei von euch am meisten? Macht, sagt an. Ihr schweigt. Die Ringe wirken nur zurück und nicht nach außen. Jeder liebt sich selber nur am meisten. O, oh, so seid ihr alle drei betrogene Betrüger. Eure Ringe sind alle drei nicht echt. Der echte Ring vermutlich ging verloren. Den Verlust zu bergen, zu ersetzen, ließ der Vater die drei für einen machen. Und also fuhr der Richter fort, wenn ihr nicht mit meinem Rat statt meines Spruches wollt, geht nur. Mein Rat ist aber der. Ihr nehmt die Sache völlig, wie sie liegt. Hat von euch jeder seinen Ring von seinem Vater, so glaube jeder sicher seinen Ring den echten. Möglich, dass der Vater nun die Tyrannei des einen Rings nicht länger in seinem Hause dulden wollte. Und gewiss, dass er euch alle drei geliebt und gleich geliebt, indem er zwei nicht drücken mögen, um einen zu begünstigen, wohl an. Es eifre jeder seiner unbestochenen, von Vorurteilen freien Liebe nach. Es strebe von euch jeder um die Wette, die Kraft des Steins in seinem Ring an Tag zu legen. Komme dieser Kraft mit Sanftmut, mit herzlicher Verträglichkeit, mit Wohltun, mit innigster Ergebenheit in Gott zu Hilf. Und wenn sich dann der Steine Kräfte bei euren Kindes, Kindeskindern äußern, so lade ich über tausend, tausend Jahre sie wiederum vor diesen Stuhl. Da wird ein weiserer Mann auf diesem Stuhle sitzen als ich und sprechen, geht. So sagte der bescheidene Richter. Yes, time for our first keynote speaker. She is a German lawyer and Muslim feminist born in Istanbul. She studies at the Free University of Berlin and has been advocating equal rights for Muslim women and girls ever since. Her views are highly critical uh, of immigrant Muslim society that is often more conservative than its counterpart in Turkey. 
And Atesh opened in 2017 the Ibn Rushd Goethe Mosque, which is the first liberal mosque in Germany, where men and women pray together and women can take the role of Iman. This was highly condemned by the Turkish religious authority and the Egypt Egyptian Fatwa Council. We're so honored that you're here with us to, to share your thoughts on Europe uh, and the role of Germany within this, this European culture. Give her an Amsterdam welcome, Ms. Saran Atesh. Thank you very much, thank you very much for the introducing and thank you very much for reading The Ring Parable, which is the best piece, in my opinion, about tolerance. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for coming. And thank you to the government here from Netherlands and uh, the city of Amsterdam to help us to protect me here to come. Because I'm under police protection in Germany and I cannot travel or go around and uh, be somewhere and talk. And Again, thank you to the police and thank you to the security. Maybe a warm <laughs> clap for them. Thank you. This security, the protection is also a proof for democracy, what we are talking about today. Since the wall in Berlin fall down, the city where I live since 1969 and the fall of the Iron Curtain, along with the collapse of the Soviet Union and Yugoslavia in 1989, Europe is, is rearranging itself. Rearranging is a process. That's, I'm sorry, a process. That's why you do not have to expect a conclusion. That would lead to stagnation. We certainly all do not want that. What we want is peace. It makes a big difference whether you rearrange yourself in peace or war. The latter is contrary to a rearrangement. Let me focus to some important dates to explain that. On December 10, 2012, Europe received the Nobel Peace Prize, as you know. Because Europe is a peace project and a proof that peace is possible between different cultures and countries. And Europe is a best practice for democracy. Let me quote briefly from the speech of uh, Barroso for the president of the European Commission when they get the prize. Peace is not mere absence of war, it is a virtue. Wrote Spinoza, Pax enim non belli privatio set virtus est. And he added, it is a state of mind, a disposition for benevolence, confidence, justice. Indeed, there can only be true peace if people are confident, at peace with their political system, reassured that their basic rights are respected. The European Union is not only about peace among nations, it incarnates as a political project that particular state of mind that Spinoza was referring to. It embodies as a community of values this vision of freedom and justice, quote, end. And this point, I must now come straight to the point. I see the community of values in Europe, the attitude Spinoza talks about, and the vision of freedom and justice that we have been pursuing in Europe since the French Revolution and the Enlightenment in Europe at risk. Because there is a group of Muslims, some Islamic countries, who have declared themselves willing to destroy the peace project and community of values just described and taking it for themselves for a political Islam. Is this a conspiracy theory? No. Is this an Islamophobia? No. You can believe me. 
I opened a liberal mosque. I'm a believer, and I don't fight against Islam, which is my religion. I find I'm fighting against patriarchy. I'm fighting as a woman against gender apartheid. I explain why I put it so bluntly. Because we don't have much time to stop a destructive de development. We are talking about we are schaffen as we can do it. So we need something to understand when we want to do it. Because whether in what state, we have to understand in what state we live in Europe for the, and what we want to leave, what kind of generation uh, for the next generation and what kind of society we want to leave for our kids. This is our responsibility. Islamists' attacks keep us breathless. This is my daily life. I'm living under police protection since 12 years and I know what I'm talking about. Since September 11, 2001, Islam has become one of the most important socio-political topics in the world. In my childhood, adolescence in Germany, Islam was not a major and important topic either at school in, or in our guest worker families. It was not a discussion if a two, three or five-year-old girl has to wear a headscarf. It's really strange for me. I come from Turkey. Turkey was unknown to be a secular state, which unfortunately is only on paper today. You know what Erdogan did with Turkey. Islamic Sharia and designated Sharia is the sole search of interpretation and um, declar I'm sorry, oh, sole source of interpretation or explanation of each article. Oh no, sorry, this, there's a confusion. On my pages, no. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, one could say that Turkey was the only Islamic country that once had the slightest chance of becoming a democratic constitutional state. I was really also in hope for that, and I'm, I'm not. I don't. I'm not dep uh, depressive or optimist, uh, op uh, pessimistic. I'm optimistic. We will do it one day. I want to mention another important date for today's topic, the f uh, August 5th in 1990. The Islamic Declaration of Human Rights, called the Cairo Declaration of Human Rights, was adopted on August 5th in 1990 by 45 of 57 member organizations of the Islamic Conference. It is intended to serve the member states as a guideline with regard to human rights but does not have a binding international character. Article 24 and 25 of this declaration said freedom, um, all the rights and freedoms cite in the Cairo Declaration of Human Rights again explicitly the Islamic Sharia and destinate Sharia as the sole source of interpretation or explanation of each article of this declaration. What does it mean? They put Islamic right Sharia and Islamic human rights over the human rights what we signed in Europe. Why do I start with the bad news? <laughs> because after this <laughs> event <laughs> and every day, my hope is, um, is going bigger and bigger. I would like to do my part in believing in the European peace project. So that what we can continue to live in peace and freedom in Europe and ask you to do the same. Ask ourselves, what can we do to keep our peace project as it is? And what can we do to live together with so many cultures and religions in peace, like the ring parable told us? The fundamentalists have the primary goal and um, an idea to change our societies in the sense of Islam. This is nothing what I want to have in Europe. I want peace between the religion. I want real democracy, what I learned in Germany. So this, the stress what we have and the situation what we have in Europe now, um, why Mrs. Uh, Councillor Merkel said uh, we can do it, we schaffen das, um, has his reasons not only in Europe, it has his reasons all over the world and the policy what people are doing with um, 
the Islamic countries. Europe is in a critical situation, actually, and this is not based on the refugee crisis back in 2015. This crisis starts, in my opinion, uh, really earlier in the 2008 with the fundamental crisis of the economy. New nationalism, therefore, treats to our fundamental European rights the search of our political elites in finding answers for a new and uncertain world order, social insecurity, and many parts of the European, the Brexit. These are probably the main reason for our current crisis. But it is now not, never too late, especially Germany and France, the two main engines for further European integration can and must play an important role in restraining the projects of peace, tolerance and prosperity. And I believe we will do it, but we don't have to forget what is what Europe makes so special. We see, a, I see a very, very worrying development regarding the rise of extremism in Europe. We know that we need to tackle extremism in our societies as it is, it tends to drive various groups in civil society away from each other. Extremism is one major trait of our times. It is built on intolerance, ignorance, homophobia and xenophobia, and it began to spread in the heart of Europe. To point this out and work on a solution based on changing European legislation accordingly and in accordance to the European Charter of Fundamental Rights was the main idea behind a very special European citizen uh, initiative named Stop Extres Extremism, which I also start with some friends. So I do something inside my religion with the mosque and something outside my religion as a civil activist and political activist and start this initiative. Um, we are registered in Brussels and we should collect one million uh, signatures, and we'd made it. We have something around 1,800,000, and um, we made it. We have schaffened us. <laughs> it's it's, it's like really up to us if we want to uh, keep our democracy and fight against extremists from the very left till the very right. I'm not talking about extremism only inside my religion, coming outside my religion, we have to be aware about the right-wing extremism as well. But unfortunately, in this days, my religion is um, the religion where terrorism comes from. And there are Muslims, not all of them, there are some Muslims who, who wants to install Sharia in every European a country, and who wants to turn Belgium, for example, to a, the first Islamic country. This is not my idea, it's not my prejudice against those people. They call, they say that. And there, I'm coming to the end, there's the Islamic party in Belgium. Now they are, um, they are in, already in some um, uh, areas um, working, and this is what they said. They want to turn Belgium to the first, um, first uh, Islamic country. So coming to the, to the end, I opened this mosque for liberal and secular Muslims where men and women are praying together where women can be a leader and say, yes, we can do it. We can achieve it. But we have to know what kind of society we want to live in. Thank you. Time for the second performance of Wende, and uh, this, perfor this song is in Dutch. It's titled "For Alles Bang Geweest, Been Afraid of Everything." Give her a, a welcoming back on the stage, Wende. <laughs> Thank you. 
Te veel mensen in een lift of streekbus. Of gewoon een kamer. Voor de krans van melkwegen, sluiers, nevels en hun zwarte gaten. Voor mijn eigen brein een stuk of wat insecten. Vrouwen, hun stemmingen en stemmen. Voor kokend water, vliezen, scharen, ademhaling. Voor de meeste onbenulligheden. Groot en groter. Voor de ontijd van mijn ouders toen vanaf kansels in kazuivels men met hel en smalle poorten dreigde. Voor sommige geluiden en het levende bij die geluiden. Voor mails en sms'en. Voor enveloppen op mijn tafel. Voor alles bang geweest. Voor alles altijd bang geweest. Voor alles bang geweest. Voor alles altijd bang geweest. Voor dromen en demonen, voor uitsluiting en vrijwel alle onbekenden. Voor de elementen, voor volk en vaderland, voor grote dromen, voor de deur wel en voor straf. Voor gepatenteerde gekken en sommige familieleden. School en alles wat erna moest komen. Voor de aanblik die ik bied en niet wil bieden. Voor de benauwenis van aangeboren schaamte. Voor alles bang geweest, voor alles altijd bang geweest. Voor alles bang geweest, voor alles altijd bang geweest. Voor de waarheid, of liever de dynamiek van harde feiten. Voor toekomst, verleden, het stuiterende hier en nu. Voor types die met messen spelen. Voor dieren, hoewel niet de meeste. Voor personen die snoevend zeggen, vrij te zijn van alle vrees. Voor gedachten, andermans of eigen. Sporen, hoogte, tekens, diepte. Alles wat aan taal ontsnapt, vermoedens van om het even. Voor God toch nog voor mijn hartslag, voor alles altijd bang geweest. Niet vrijblijvend, maar met recht en reden. Voor alles altijd overtuigd, hoog in de adem, zuiver in de leer, tot in het merg bang geweest. Op het stupide en futiele af met oogkleppen en hondentrouw, voor alles altijd bang geweest. Voor alles bang geweest, voor alles altijd bang geweest. Voor alles bang geweest. Voor zowel de grote greep als laatste resten, rafelranden, kleinste deeltjes, neutronen, elektronen. Alles groter dan het wijkend zelf. Voor sferen en zuizingen en de zekerheid ook thuis in één oogwenk alles kwijt te zijn. Voor gebouwen zonder ramen, voor doodgaan alle doden, voor dood zijn misschien iets minder. Voor deze constatering, voor constateren, voor kinderen die vragen stellen, maar meer nog voor die vragen. Voor alles bang geweest, voor alles altijd bang geweest. Voor alles bang geweest, voor alles altijd bang geweest. Maar niet voor jou. Niet voor jou.
my needs for y'all. And this beautiful performance of Wende will be followed again by a performance of Lars Eidinger. And this time he will read out a text which was selected by our next keynote speaker, Simon Strauss. And it's a text by Stefan Zweig. Um, welcome him please to the stage again, Lars Eidinger. Auszug aus Stefan Zweig, die, Mo die moralische Entgiftung Europas. Ein Vortrag für die Europatagung der Academia di Roma 1932. Ist einmal eine Gemeinschaft geschaffen, eine neue Generation, die in ihrer Jugend ohne Hass und mit Ehrfurcht vor der gemeinsamen europäischen Leistung erzogen wurde, ist einmal in allen Ländern eine breitere Schicht zugleich national und europäisch eingestellter Menschen geschaffen, so können wir daran denken, höhere Organisationen einzusetzen, etwa eine europäische Akademie, eine europäische Universität, die abwechselnd bald in dieser, bald in jener Hauptstadt eines Landes tagt, eine Akademie, welche die einzelnen Akademien der einzelnen Länder umfasst, eine höchste Instanz, die friedlich und freundschaftlich jede Annäherung fördert, jedes Missverständnis verhindert. Gewisse solcher Ansätze sind im Völkerbund versucht worden, aber schwerfällig im Apparat, zu stark von der Diplomatie beherrscht, zu unjugendlich und professoral hat er sich dieser, Lebe hat er sich dieser lebendigen Aufgabe bisher noch nicht gewachsen gezeigt, und die Atmosphäre des Misstrauens eh verstärkt als vermindert. Das Politische ist dort noch wesentlicher als das Kulturelle. Und da Politik immer Schwierigkeiten bietet und auf Spannungen gegründet ist, muss unsere ganze Bemühung darauf hingehen, zur Gesundung Europas die Annäherung der nationalen Mentalitäten mehr und mehr auf die Tragfläche der kulturellen Leistungen zu verschieben. Hier wo wir wahrhaft verbunden sind, alle Nationen, alle Klassen, können wir am ehesten hoffen, zu einem unpolitischen, überpolitischen Einverständnis zu gelangen. Und es scheint mir darum wichtig, vor der politischen, militärischen, finanziellen Einheit Europas, der heute noch einen Gegenwille entgegenstrebt, die kulturelle zu verwirklichen. Unendlich viel zu einer solchen Verständigung könnte ein gemeinsames europäisches Organ, eine Zeitschrift oder besser noch eine Tageszeitung wirken, die mit dem gleichen Texte in allen Sprachen Europas erscheint und sich zum Ziele setzt, jedes Wort zu unterdrücken, das das Missverständnis vermehrt und auf jede Möglichkeit hinzuweisen, welche die Bindung und das Verständnis steigert, kurzum eine positive eine optimistische, eine Energien verstärkende Zeitung oder Zeitschrift, die der Generation aller Länder zeigt, dass geheimnisvoll verborgen eine Aufgabe und ein Werk da ist, an dem sie arbeiten und an dem sie mithelfen kann, wenn sie von ihrem Lande aus und ihrer Nation die geistige Leistung steigert. Auf dieser Sphäre, die kulturelle, Vermögen wir zuerst hinzuwirken und dort den Widerstreit der Nationen, statt ihn völlig auszuschalten, in Zusammenarbeit umzusetzen, die nationalen Energien durch den Wettstreit fruchtbar zu machen für das gemeinsame Ziel und somit der neuen, der kommenden Jugend ein stärkeres Weltvertrauen, einen leidenschaftlicheren Zukunftsglauben mitzuteilen, als die Kriegsgeneration ihn allein noch aufzubringen wusste. Stellt sich also die moralische Entgiftung Europas als eine sehr langfristige, sehr sorgsam und liebevoll zu beginnende Kur dar, 
bei der wir die endgültige Heilung vielleicht selbst nicht mehr erleben werden, geschieht diese Leistung vielleicht eigentlich nicht mehr für uns selbst, für unsere geprüfte und an den Schwierigkeiten der Zeit erprobte Generation, sondern erst für die nächste, die kommende, die neue Jugend, welche Europa neben dem eigenen Vaterlande als gemeinsame Heimat des Herzens betrachten wird, so heißt dies darum nicht, dass wir heute müßig sein dürfen und all diese aufklärenden, bildende, all diese aufklärende bildende Arbeit dem nächsten Geschlechte überlassen. Auch innerhalb unserer Generation ist noch Wesentlichstes zu tun und vor allem dies, zu vermeiden, dass neue Fieberkeime des Hasses neue seelische Entzündungsprozesse, diese langsam einsetzende Aktionen gefährden. Wir aber persönlich, die wir uns das Ideal höherer Eintracht zwischen den Nationen bei Wahrung der Eigenart aller Nationen als höchstes sittliches Ziel setzen, wir hätten außerdem dazu noch die Verpflichtung, durch aktive, unermüdliche Tätigkeit im Sinne der Gerechtigkeit den jüngeren Geschlechte ein Beispiel zu geben dass wir uns jedes Wortes enthalten, das Missvertrauen zwischen den Nationen zu steigern vermöchte, dass wir unsere Feder nie mit einem Satz beschmutzen, der die Ehre, das Ansehen oder auch nur die Eitelkeit einer Nachbarnation herabsetzen könnte, ist Selbstverständlichkeit für unser Fühlen. Aber wir haben außerdem noch die positive Pflicht, jede Gelegenheit zu ergreifen, um die Leistung unseres, unserer Brüderländer in dem eigenen Lande und vor der Welt zu rühmen. Die Jugend zu überzeugen, dass eben die Generation, die den fürchterlichsten Hass der Welt gekannt, diesen Hass hassen gelernt hat, weil er unfruchtbar ist im Sinne des kulturellen Aufbaus und weil er die schöpferische Kraft der Menschheit mindert. Wir müssen, wir Schriftsteller, Künstler, Musiker, wir geistigen Menschen alle, der Jugend ein Beispiel geben, dass jede geistige Leistung in jedem Lande zugleich Kameradschaft mit Gleichgesinnten und allen Gleichbestrebten aller Länder und Nationen bedeutet und dass unser Gefühl der Bewunderung für jede Leistung nicht Halt machen darf an Sprachen und Grenzen wie an verschlossenen Türen. Wir müssen zeigen, dass Bewunderung die innere Kraft nicht abnützt, sondern steigert und dem allein der Enthusiasmus immer wieder in sich aufzu anzufachen weiß, eine neue geistige Jugend immer wieder geschenkt ist. Je mehr wir uns dem Geiste verbinden, desto weitere Flächen des Lebens vermögen wir liebend zu überschauen. Und wenn es auch uns selbst nicht mehr beschieden sein sollte, wieder einen klaren, wolkenlosen Himmel der Eintracht über Europa zu erblicken, so wollen wir doch dieses noch unsichtbare Ideal unsere ganze Kraft bereithalten und ihm unsere ganze Leidenschaft widmen, damit die nächste Generation in allen Nationen die Sphäre eines von allem Hass und Misstrauen entgifteten Europas als zweite Heimat neben und über der eigenen Heimat erlebe. Möge sie dann lächeln über die Torheiten, denen wir jahrelang verfallen waren, über unsere Irrtümer, über unser Misstrauen. Aber möge sie uns nicht beschuldigen können, wir hätten nicht unser Bestes getan, wieder zur Gerechtigkeit zurückzufinden und der Vernunft ihr ewig schöpferisches Wort wieder zurückzugeben. A speech in 1932, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um. It was selected by our next speaker, the second keynote speaker of tonight. He is a German historian, journalist, and author. He studied classical studies and history in Basel, and from uh, 2012 till 2016, he pursued his PhD at the Humboldt University in Berlin. In 2017, he released his debut novel, Sieben Nächte, Seven Nights, uh, to much critical acclaim. Even one newspaper called him the greatest talent of his generation. Give him a very big welcome to Amsterdam, Simon Strauss. Thank you. Nothing, ladies and gentlemen, nothing that we are, think and dream 
belongs to us alone. Everything is inheritance, everything is transmitted. Europe is not news. It's not an intervention or achievement of our time. We have received the European idea that includes more than just geographic data as a gift from the past. People believed in Europe when there were no watches yet, no institutionalized rights, no idea of an open future. The hope that there could be a utopian order that binds conceptually together what in reality threatens to shatter in one's hand. The idea that a parameter of the living space is larger than that which can be seen with one's own eye. Striving to break and record the sequence of time to make history accessible. Europe, pictures of an exhibition. These are the real driving forces of European thinking. The majority and the powerful speak of Europe today and mean free trade, data and climate protection, counter-terrorism, legal security and high-quality standards for milk and democracy. They say Europe and mean the EU. Position Brussels strategically as a counterpoint to Beijing, Moscow and Washington as a system of values that secretly wants to be a system of goods but is too noble to admit it. Like an elderly woman who brags about her opera subscription in front of her girlfriends and then at home watches schmaltzy music shows on TV. Europe as a placebo, that is not what I want to talk about. The real healing power of the idea of Europe can only be experienced by those who are open to what culture, Europe means culturally. Which secret transnational links exist between art and architecture, language and typefaces. How spaces, gestures and schools of thought here contain mysterious affirmations of interplay. An interplay of different languages, living environments and traditions, but also and above all the interaction between two different regions of the mind. Reason on the one hand and empathy on the other. This is the mixed doubles that Europe plays on a variety of courts under different weather conditions. Sometimes the return is stronger, sometimes the surf, but one never enters the court without the other. At the moment, rationality is much more popular Society values critique and enlightenment more than wondrous faith and yearning passion. But Europe is also defined by the mythos and has always given the unexplainable, the inwardness and entrancement a strong right, accepted the slogan alongside the solution as a flip side of the coin. Europe was and is also a romantic formula, a world of hope for fantasists and enthusiasts a keyword for Zeitgeist as well as for Weltschmerz. And it's a central basic concept of a cultural, one could also say aesthetic, education for freedom. European scholar Jakob Burkhardt, who just had his 200th birthday, argued that culture is the third great power in Europe alongside the state and religion. As we reflect on Europe today, we should remember this because simply ignoring the impact of culture can lead to serious consequences in the long run. We have to find a new tone again today, a completely different pitch in which we talk about Europe. The phrases of politicians and bureaucrats, of traders and journalists are faded and ineffective because they are used by everyone everywhere without special effort. The political talk about Europe has become the talk of the advantages or disadvantages of the EU for individual member states. The poison that has thus quietly trickled back into the consciousness takes its effect through relentless focus on mutual mistrust. If Stefan Zweig in 1932 thought that the detoxification of Europe was possible not through political initiatives, but only through trans-political cultural understandings, then he relied on the special characteristics of culture, its temporal generosity. Unlike politics and business, both of which are jump hectically between time periods, are quick to absorbed by history and driven by progress and competition, the essential products of culture withstand the tides of time. The thought by Plato reaches through the epochs. A scene by Shakespeare, a Matenia picture or a line by marie Louise Kaschnitz do not lose their value as the years go by. Art and culture have no expiration date. They can touch people from without their ages, instigate and integrate them no matter which year they assign to their lives. And culture is another essential characteristic. It is transgressing. 
where defined borders divide up the individual European countries as they must for the sake of the functionality of educational and social systems, culture flies over them, has the opportunity to touch lives regardless of their geographic location. Finnish violin concertos are also understood in Romania. An Austrian can be touched by the line of a Spanish poem. A Dutchman can see himself in a Polish picture. José Ortega y Gasset once said, if we were to take stock of our spiritual possessions, it would turn out that most of it steams not from our respective homeland, but the shared European fundus. Four-fifths of our internal possessions are European common property. Culture is transtemporal and transnational. That's its force, what distinguishes it from politics and business, from religion. It is separated thanks to its open-mindedness of interpretation and its playful instinct for entertainment. Dogma and radicalism are only conceivable in the process of development. In its reception, culture must always be liberal, open to the many. That is why, in contrast to politics or finance, culture can serve as a platform upon which the national mindsets can come closer. Culture is, in fact, the only point of departure for approaching Europe as a shared home of the heart. But in my opinion, culture can only become a home of the heart and strength in Europe if it is independent of the two other potencies, in particular, if it is emancipated from politics. We live in an age in which culture too often lets itself become the mate of policy making. The urge to make oneself independent from the events of the day, to claim the freedom to create counter-realities, visions, mannerisms, words of art, seems weaker than ever. The urge is intimidated by the strict primacy of moral policy. The label escapist is attached to everything that is not directly related to current events. When an evening in the theater for once has nothing to do with Trump or a photo exhibition has nothing to say about the climate disaster. What has become of the artist's pleasure in the strange, the contradictory, mysterious, inexplicable? Why does culture let go of its unique selling proposition so easily? Its beauty is precisely that it does not have to be based on election programs, morality or profit rates. Art is free, they say, but free to do what? To simply recast the editorials on popular attitudes in its respective medium? Shouldn't it instead be free to offer another surprising worldview, to argue sensually, to look at humanity from an existential angle, to see the transtemporal, transtemporal potential of our emotions and come closer to our core? That would be the real freedom that art could take on. But it would once again have to claim a stronger intrinsic logic, courageously speak a different language than the one that can already be heard everywhere else. Imagination, beauty, Weltschmerz, these are its currently neglected godparents. But only if culture remembers this, only if it confidentially and willfully stands up to politics and speaks its own words again, only then can it help Europe become the home of the heart. If it is only a means to a day-to-day -day political purpose, it will not succeed. However you define art as a means of existential consolation, as Euripides did, as a way to purify the soul, as Aristotle did, as a drive for the re-enchantment of the everyday-like, as the Romantics thought, or as a chance to improve oneself as a human being in the mold of Schiller. In whatever form, art and culture offer the chance of a mimesis of the world by other means. Its goal is precisely not to reach scientific truth, but to awaken the viewer's empathy and sen science sentences, to tempt the viewer to think and feel more generously. There's a lot of humane and community-building power in culture. Take the theater, for example. In essence, it offers the best opportunity to heal European society from the currently dominant self-referential fixation on identity. As has been broadly remarked, the identity movement on the right and the left relies on the same illiberal idea that their personal experience in life alone entitled them to create a worldview. As it was not a crucial part of the world, let alone a world view, that it speaks to people of very different backgrounds and attitudes. In the theater, you get to experience exactly that, the diversity of different character traits and attitudes towards the world. Here you meet the wise men who were defeated anyway, the errant heroes, bourgeois blunderers and surreal messengers of the death. You even get to know queens here. Where else can you meet queens in 2018? 
For this reason alone, our politicians and identity activists should go to the theater as often as possible to shake up their counter-images, to understand and accept otherness, to morally detoxify, as Zweig would say. In the sense of its pluralistic claim, it is necessary for culture to also show the strange, the incomprehensible, the freaky, even the archaic or reactionary, because it is present in our society. When we are no longer able to voice the resentments that exist in Europe in the theater, that's when it gets dangerous, as Van Castor said recently. He who admires Celine Malaparte and Ernst Jünger precisely because they oppose the spirit of the time. And also Chris Durkin calls out, good art is like an intruder who is taken in and whom I don't know yet. In culture, you don't get far with moral political attitudes. It is the stomping ground for unpleasant people, a murderer like Caravaggio or an anti-democrat like Balzac, who Marx said was a terrible royalist, and yet he admitted that no one described French society better. Or the movies of a Roman Polanski, which are hard to dismiss by simply referring to his dubious sex life. In politics and morality, that might be okay. But in culture, one should be careful with prohibition. To take down a painting because it doesn't correspond to current sexual morality. To remove a poem from a house wall because it evokes chauvinistic associations. To black out incriminating words in children's books. All this will make a European community of spirit not stronger, but weaker. What Europe needs from culture is disagreement, debate, productive opposition. While dangerous in the political arena where tension and hatred are quick to arise, as Stefan Zweig suspected in 1932, in the protected sphere of culture, everything can be tried out. There must still be room for the most daring experiments. In other words, here you can dream and let go. In order to encourage each other to find our own language again, it is necessary today that artists and those in the cultural sphere in Europe once again unite in groups. I believe that at the moment, more than ever, strength can only be developed collectively. I believe that organizations that are not, as Zweig puts it, the dreams, the dream, Zweig's dream of higher organization that are not too unuseful and professoral make new, stimulating sense in our hyper-individualistic times. Rich Germany's cultural role today could be, as it was in the past and most recently in 1947 after the devastating World War, as an empowerer and breeding ground for artistic groups and movements that spread across Europe and unite, play together, to return to the tennis analogy. These groups are united by their interest in aesthetics, language, images, sounds, movement, and thus they come together, not through their attitude towards gay marriage or the transfer union. Germany's role in Europe must not only be defined by its economic policy, it must also be filled by a cultural movement which works together and is independent of party political interests, which interrogates the European spirits, its pasts, including the dark sides, and draws strengths from which from it for the future. The idea of the Euro community must be experienced on a small scale so that it can take effect on a large scale. The doubts about the European Union can be countered not by treating Europe as a mere administrative economic institution, but as a cultural focal point. A short-scale example of this is the group Working on Europe, which was started last year on the night after the Brexit vote and of which I'm a member. Young thinkers meet regularly in a European provincial region, away from the globalized metropolis to get to know the European intellectual space. These meetings consist on the one hand of discussing and redefining central terms of culture, and on the other hand of meeting local young Europeans and old eyewitnesses of history. There's talk of, culture, there's talk of cultural futures and archiving of Europe's different pasts. It's not a question of political pedagogy. There's no clear programmatic goal. The meeting and the need to call Europe one's home of the heart, to find new tones and colors to describe what surrounds us as an ideal, that is what we call working on Europe. Whether Stefan Zweig meant such an institution when he spoke in Rome in 1932 about the moral detoxification of Europe, in any case, he too wanted an energy-boosting community that shows the younger generation in all European countries that they are participating in a shared cause when they are working to increase the intellectual output of their home countries. His world, his word holds. 
whoever makes culture, is engaged in art, or has a philosophical thought, does something for Europe. Not in the form of regulations or trade agreements, not for the surface, but in the form of mental insurance certificates of sentient supporting pillars. Nothing, ladies and gentlemen, nothing that we are, think, and dream belongs to us alone. Everything is inheritance, everything is transmission. Europe is one big broadcaster. There are so many secret frequencies, so many voices and moods. All we have to do is to flip the switch to receive. Then we will be saved. Thank you. We will soon st uh, end the evening with a panel discussion and after that a performance by Wende. Um, but before we do that, we have the last introduction to the panel discussion. And it's also um, a text uh, which, um, which has been selected by the organization of this festival. And um, uh, Lars Eidinger is going to read it out. It's, it's, it's Goethe, it's Erlkönig. Uh, but before we do that, can I invite you to the stage and ask you a question? Because actually, I think Simon was talking to you as an artist, as a performer. Uh, uh, um, he said, okay, um, art is a way to the heart. And art doesn't have to be political, it can open the mind. Uh, so before, because you're also part of this festival, and, 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 and it's of course a risk to only ask you to perform these texts, but you also have quite a... Uh, uh, your own opinions about the subject. So before we, we ask you to, 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 to read out the text of Goethe, what, what's your perspective on this theme? Yeah, I mean, it's quite a complex subject. Of course, subject. that's why we're here. Yeah, True, yeah. yeah. Uh, but I just can tell you that I'm, I'm, since 20 years, I'm part of a company in Berlin, the Schaubühne. Um, it's a theater company and we, we travel a lot, so I've been all over the world. Um, and it's very interesting to see how different the people react on what we do. And most of the time we play Shakespeare plays, we play a lot of Hamlet, we play Richard III. And what I find very valuable is we don't change anything. So we take the text like it is. Okay, we translate it, which is always kind of difficult because in my opinion, you, if you translate Shakespeare, you, you lose maybe 80% of, of its quality. <laughs> no, it's true, but I mean, we still deal with the subjects. So you translate it in, in, in German? In German. Or you yeah, in exactly. German. Yeah. yeah, but it's interesting that we've never been somewhere where people said, okay, these kind of conflicts, they have nothing to do with us. Yeah. And it's very interesting. And it's also very frustrating because I, I think that we will never have a time where we think, okay, the problems that Shakespeare, the conflicts that Shakespeare describes, um, we are over them, you know? We succeeded. We will never reach that no. point. And it's no. very interesting that it's like a ritual that we play them again and again, and people look at it and we are able to reflect on them and we are able to understand the conflicts, but we are not able to solve them. Hmm. But on the other hand, to sound a bit more optimistic, I think it's very fascinating, especially in theater, that um, whenever I go to the theater and the performance starts at eight and I arrive in the theater at six, there's a long line of people waiting for tickets, yeah. and especially young people. And this is something that gives me hope, and that was something I was not believe in it anymore. And it was okay for me to do something for an elitaire a group of people. You know, that's completely fine for me. But suddenly I have the feeling that we have a strong influence on mm. the young generation in telling them our story. Mm. And in the hope maybe that they, like Zweig said, yeah. One day we'll, we'll be in a, uh, live in a better world. And that yeah. sounds very naive in a way, but uh, theater makes me believe in this. And this is something very uh, beautiful. Okay, thank you. Um, can I now ask you to perform your last text? Yes. Uh, you will read it out. It's from Goethe, of course, like one of the, the pillars of European culture, you could say. And the text is Erl König. Yes. Thank right. you. Give him. A, a, a big applause. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. It would be nice.
I, 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 I wonder all the time what's the difference between a warm and a cold applause. <laughs> Give, give me a cold applause one yeah. day. <laughs> oh, okay, I know. now I know. <laughs> Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, Erlkönig. Wer reitet zu spät durch Nacht und Wind? Es ist der Vater mit seinem Kind. Er hat den Knaben wohl in dem Arm. Er fasst ihn sicher. Er hält ihn warm. Mein Sohn, was birgst du so bang dein Gesicht? Siehst, Vater, du den Erlkönig nicht? Den Erlenkönig mit Kron und Schweif? Mein Sohn, es ist ein Nebelstreif. Du liebes Kind, komm, geh mit mir. Gar schöne Spiele spiele ich mit dir. Manch bunte Blumen sind an dem Strand. Meine Mutter hat manch gülden Gewand. Mein Vater, mein Vater, und hörest du nicht, was Erlenkönig mir leise verspricht? Sei ruhig, bleib ruhig, mein Kind. In dürren Blättern säuselt der Wind. Willst feiner Knabe du mit mir gehen? Meine Töchter sollen dich warten schön. Meine Töchter führen den nächtlichen Rhein und wiegen und tanzen und singen dich ein. Mein Vater, mein Vater, und siehst du nicht dort Erlkönigs Töchter am düsteren Ort? Mein Sohn, mein Sohn, ich sehe es genau, es scheinen die alten Weiden so grau. Ich liebe dich, mich reizt deine schöne Gestalt und bist du nicht willig, so brauche ich Gewalt. Mein Vater, mein Vater, jetzt fasst er mich an. Erlkönig hat mir Leids getan. Dem Vater grauselt's, er reitet geschwind, er hält in den Armen das ächzende Kind, er reicht den Hof mit Mühe und Not, in seinen Armen das Kind war tot. I'm going to put some chairs on the stairs now. Thank you. And I'm going to invite, of course, the two keynote speakers to join me on stage. Take your speakers. There they are. And the third. Let me introduce to you the third speaker who's going to reflect on, um, on the two, please, uh, on these two keynote speakers. He is a Belgian art historian and curator, the former director of Tate Modern in London, former intendant of Volksbühne in Berlin, um, studied art history, but in the Netherlands he's much more famous because he was co-founding director of Witte de Witt and director of Museum Boymans van Beuningen. Give him a warm welcome, Chris de Kroon. It's, uh, it's Dutch. It's Dutch warm welcome. I'm so sorry. It's, you're completely right. It's stupid. Thank you for reminding me that my English is. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you for thank your you. beautiful keynote uh, speeches. Um, let me first go to you, uh, since you are new on the stage, um, to ask you to, to, to reflect on these two statements. What, what, is, what is your analysis of the question about the cultural role of Germany in Europe at the moment? It's interesting that you say what is the, the question about the cultural role of Germany, because we have been hearing Stefan Zweig, who is not yeah. a German, he's Austrian. Yes. But I think it's thanks to Stefan Zweig that we had in 1948 yes. a notion of what Europe should and could do. We also heard Goethe, and if you think about somebody who defended the mobility of people and the mobility of ideas, um, maybe not exactly in the Erlkönig, then it's of course Goethe. And Lessing, well Lessing is uh, 
it's a problem because uh, it's very funny that today, if we talk about uh, Europe, we should talk about Germany, France. And what did Lessing do? Lessing, um, he said, well, finished, you know, with Moliere and with the French, I'm going to reintroduce Shakespeare. But it's a funny, in interesting mirror for what's happening today, given the situation Macron, Merkel, think about the Carl's Prize. What I'm saying about this is that we, indeed, we have to come back to what Germany can do, also in terms of its culture. And as a respondent, um, I'm going to, uh, probably a, res a good respondent is always somebody who spoils the evening. Oh. And spoiling the evening in the sense that I think that um, for the moment, we are expecting Germany, Angela Merkel, to really think forward and not just to think about protecting Germany, but also to look for a better world. And that better world starts, indeed, with a new idea, a new vision of Europe. And culture, Simon, is not going just to save us. What we need is a new Europe based on a Verfassung, a European Verfassung, which is reflecting the democracies of the nation states. And I'm saying this because we know that uh, the whole idea of Europe started with Egalité, Fraternité, Liberté. Then, of course, it got reinforced and as a response to what happened, the horrors of the Second World War. But now we have new horrors. We have all these people knocking on heaven's door, knocking on fortress Europe. And I think these people know much better what Europe is than Some we. Of them. Not Some of them. them, not all of them, but many of them know what Europe is, because That's when we speak coming. about Europe, we speak about am I European? And indeed, our European identity is constant in flux. That's how it mm. should be. But now we have a challenge and we have a challenge. And the challenge is indeed this influx, the influx of these new people knocking, knocking on the door of Europe. And I think going back to the question of France and Germany, that's where Macron, I think for the moment, took the lead, had to take the lead. I know he's not solving issues in his home country, but at least when we heard him speaking in Aachen during the Karls Prize, he spoke to students, he spoke to young people. There is an incredible enthusiasm to do the work again. Mm. And what we have to forget is to create a new narrative for Europe. We have to be very, very specific. We have to be very technical in the sense of Habermas, in the sense of you know, all these political thinkers right now, Etienne Balibar, who say we have to work technically. And I think you're also a very good example of saying we have to be very, very specific. And what is the response of Merkel in Aachen? 20 minutes as a kind of laudatio. And she says, well, we have to think about the future. And Europe is thinking about the future. No, Europe is not thinking about the future. Europe is the thinking of now. Mm. And we cannot lose our time. And culture is playing a role, absolutely. But there is much, much, much more at stake right now. <laughs> funny. Uh, funny that you mentioned Macron in this, because he would definitely opposed to what you just said, because no one in the moment in the political sphere has a bigger, um, uh, a bigger closeness to culture. I mean, where is he coming from? If you ask Macron, and why is he someone who is impressing you? It's Let me just, maybe just, mm -hmm. he was stud he studied in the high class mm -hmm. French universities, but he didn't study politics, he didn't study economics, he did that as well in the end, but he studied first Paul Ricoeur, philosophy. And his speeches, I just once the, the most famous maybe on Europe he did in the university in, in Paris, is not a typical political speech. It is a speech which focuses on, the, for example, the importance of language, the importance of culture. All of these things, uh, he has, I would say, he is the best example of how a new narrative for Europe could be. Exactly not technical as Merkel does. Merkel is only thinking on about Europe technically, and no. he loses. No, economic, he loses. No. Mer Mer Merkel, economically and technically. Merkel, when she speaks about refugees, for instance, she's speaking about moral duty, which is not enough. Uh, not and only. I think what we need is a, a much, much stronger take of these things. And I disagree. 
because when you heard in what do you disagree i disagreed with? because when you heard macron speaking in aachen of course he's incredibly aware of the role of culture absolutely but he's also incredibly aware that we need and i don't know how to say this in english we need a new a new european verfassung yeah. and urgently or and we have to remember the verfassung we have fundamental rights in europe and we had the idea of european verfassung we have i i will uh, i will um, uh, take another name, which is a, a big role model for me, not only Habermas, like Dolf Sternberger, who described the Verfassungspatriotismus, uh, Constitution patriotism. Yes, and, uh, a fundament, fundament, fundament fundaments, be, and think, who uh, said no freedom for the enemy of freedom. So he, the idea of European identity, the idea of uh, bringing together all the languages and being friends with, with your neighbor, we had all that in the history. and. Macron, in my opinion, now is the first one who tried to recognize, who tried to start a debate. And I don't have, I have a little bit hope in Macron. I, I, I never had really a hope uh, in Merkel, but uh, when it comes you don't to Europe, you, you, you I never, I don't believe her because she's, she's a good politician for Germany, a very good politician for economics. She understands capitalism very well. After but isn't, order. isn't, isn't she's then... Uh, and she understands, really, she yeah. understands after the fall. You know, she's from Eastern Germany. And yeah. uh, when somebody understands capitalism, then most of the East, uh, <laughs> East Germans uh, did that, some of them. Okay. No. But isn't that then a paradox? Because you could say that Merkel and the capitalist economic project is the dominant project in Europe. So actually, you, you could say Germany is dominating Europe, but then in an economical way. No, you Not forget, identity. You, you forget I, I, one Can I say something? Yes. One, 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 some more sentence yeah. about identity. We have to talk about identity and European identity, and there is uh, somehow a European identity. And as a foreigner coming to Europe, uh, what you said, knocking on the door, knocking but then, on the door. Yeah. My parents knocked on the yeah. door because they come from a very poor situation, and now I'm a lawyer, and also my mom uh, couldn't uh, read and write, you know. So Europe is a chance for lots of people, and they understand that. And it's a chance also for freedom. So they are coming here because they want to have freedom and democracy. So, but not all of them. And what I want to say is identity. We, as people coming to Europe, we cannot say, in, especially in German, we are proud to be German. You know, it's not so easy to say, I'm proud to be German. Why? Because Germans cannot say that. No. They have big problems to say that. I'm coming from Turkey, you know, and Turkish people, they don't have any problems to say, I love my country. And I'm proud to be Turkish or Kurdish. I'm Kurdish and Turkish, so I'm proud. I love it to be Kurdish-Turkish. It's yeah. very nice. And, but <laughs> <laughs> do you know any German who can say, hey, it's so cool to be German? Why? Soccer fans, so, soccer, fans. Soccer, fans. Soccer, soccer fans. Soccer fans. Soccer fans. Soccer Yeah, of course. But Don't. But you sorry, you're in Amsterdam at the moment. Yeah. We cannot talk about football. So that's, that's the offer. You <laughs> cannot invite people to feel German, but you can invite people to feel European and yeah. be European. But I don't think yeah. it's, um, we should oppose economics vis-a-vis -vis culture. No. Because there is Why? something else, yeah. is that we learned since the past, I think, 20 years, that we cannot just give up the idea of the nation state. No, no, that, that's and, not what and, I want. And, and, and what I'm saying is what we need me. is a verfassung which, is, which has these democratic regulations, yeah. very strong regulations, very practical regulations, I'm which are you. mirroring the nation states. Because otherwise we have yeah. the problem of Heimat, we have the problem of identity, we have the problem of the Catalan. So it's economics, yes, I'm it's missing. culture, yes, but it's also thinking about how can we, how can we create um, not a, a supra-nation state called Europe, mm -hmm. not a supra-democracy, uh, but something which is very, very strong. Yeah. And there, Germany is not with us, because what Germany is doing, yeah. they are thinking only yeah. about economics, so, so. about their surplus. And, and Merkel is actually... And what how can we change that? So how can, uh, can Germany... <laughs> Not the door of Merkel. Because, That's it's the question to you, because yeah. you, are, you are called one of yeah. the Merkel generation, right? I mean, from your 18th birthday until now, until you, you, you have been uh, arraigned 
by Merkel. Uh, so, so yeah, well, <laughs> you, you just yeah, have one it's just, so, so how can we change that? Because what the risk of not entering, I mean, Germany not entering this debate, you know, which, which was suggested by you is, is, is perhaps problematic? Why? Maybe it's good that Germany is not always taking part <laughs> in everything. I mean, okay. uh, I would. I mean, maybe we're on a different level. I don't. I'm not that interested in the political question at the moment. No. Europe, ah. European Europe is a political question. That's for sure. But there are so many people who know more than all of us. The three, he, who knows about the technical problems? You know, people in all different kinds of uh, institutions t deal with this, and it's so hyper complex that I don't. He said, don't, don't oh. bother me with that kind of I, I, just don't, I just don't think that <laughs> I... I'm good enough a, to say I understand yeah. a little yeah. bit about yeah. that. As a lawyer, probably. <laughs> As a yeah. lawyer, yes. Yeah. But, we but cannot if you ask me, I would just say, I wouldn't try to say we mm. need uh, this and this for the future of Europe uh, as, a po uh, as a political environment. I would say we need more uh, interest in the binding forces yeah. of culture. That's all what I can say as a writer, maybe as a cultural journalist. No, you also say Europe and is a pro project of the heart. Yeah, because I think the heart is not touched by technical questions. The heart is, quite, is, is touched, and we need the heart to, to let Europe together. The heart is touched by the trans-temporal and transnational force of culture. That's what Zweig said in 1932. R remember the date, 1932, yeah. where everything is at stake. Where? He focuses on culture and says, in politics we have hatred and everything, so how can we use culture to save our Where idea? Where are the... Okay, let's talk about... Wir schaffen das, Germany. Where are Zweig was in Austria, but where are the Zweigs? Where are the lessons? Where are the good of today? And I think that there is a kind of not a corroboration of the European thinking in Germany, but there is a kind of laissez-faire. I'm not saying it's a negative idea. For me, the last time I really felt that Germany was interested in Europe was in 2006. Why 2006? Because suddenly we have. Sadly enough, we have Lanter Idee, which is connected to the public relations campaign of Weltmeisterschaft Fußball. But mm. it was important because we heard Land der Idee. And funnily enough, after 2006, and in 2006 there were all these kind of phenomena, very, very interesting, from the magazine Mercure questioning this, an artist like Schlingensief, who was constantly like a new good on the road, thinking about what does it mean, Heimat, and by the way, Schlingensief discovered, as a true European, Wagner only through Bunuel, the French filmmaker. And Schlingensief has been saying that, I didn't know who Wagner was, I never listened to it, but suddenly <laughs> I hear the music in Bunuel. There are many examples of that. 2006 is a crucial mm. year, but now summer, I, feel, dream. I feel that the Land der Idee is not really Germany anymore. It's the Land der Bilder, yes. It's their Land der Kultur, but the land of ideas has moved over the Rhine to the West. And what we see in Germany right now is a kind of encapsulation of culture, whereby the culture is not really purse. You don't feel this influx. Okay. Do you agree? <laughs> you have. I don't, I don't you, think you, so. You, Germany is not the land of the ideas, the ideas anymore, no. but the land of culture. No, no the no. land of ideas in the sense of a porousness, in the sense of transparency. Let it go, go, vai, viens, aller, retour, taking it up, absorbing it, spitting it out again, like a kind of anthropophagist. I don't feel that. Mm. Yeah, maybe. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to say I agree a little. <laughs> I agree with that. With Simon or with yeah. me? <laughs> with you. Okay. <laughs> and, and I'm, fr I'm a little bit frustrated because, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, I, I I uh, the name of my <laughs> mosque, you know, it's Ibn Rushd Goethe <laughs> Moshe. Yeah. So I, mm -hmm. uh, it's not by accident that I give uh, this name. It's a, uh, it's a bridge. Uh, the two, these two men were bridge makers between Orient and Occident. And I, I sure. love Goethe since I can uh, un I understand uh, since my the, uh, adolescence. The are we losing so we, out have, on? we lose so much things what I want to bring together is yeah this but this what are we losing yeah. because yeah. is it is it a bad thing I don't know but the, f the, the he's my question is that a bad thing uh, that Germany is not the land of the ideas is not the 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 the, the anymore the anymore. Anymore. anymore the land That's of Goethe the same what I said. and the qu and you said, I, I don't know uh, uh, first and then you explained a little bit uh, what you meant with that mm -hmm. Uh, analysis and you said I think I agree and then the question is what are we missing out on then what is the problematic side of that analysis 
in these days, I, I, I think politics is, uh, is more concentrated in economics, just economics, nothing else. And uh, Germany is so strong because we have a really, really strong economy. We are export Weltmeister, you know? This is the most uh, word what I hear uh, about uh, Germany. When you, are, when you go uh, outside of Germany, so ask yourself how people look to Germany, yeah. why people come to Germany. Most people are coming to Germany not because of the culture. They don't want to go to the theater. They don't want to go to Schaubino or Volksbino. They, they are not coming to, <laughs> to read uh, the new uh, actors, you know, authors. They don't even know who's, <laughs> who's who, you know. But, but um, if, you, if you go to Iraq, for example, and I was there last year, and you talk to young people, they read the, all, the Germans. Go to Lessing, they read all of them, Schiller, they talk about the, the great people from um, yeah, Hannah Arendt, they there read are, that. There yeah. are exceptions, eh? yeah. because yeah. Didier Ribon with Retour à Reims was, and I really can say that because I'm Belgium and I'm je suis flamand, mais pas fanatique de mon état, I'm Flemish but not fanatic, <laughs> so I'm interested in French culture. Didier Ribon was more popular with Retour à Reims, much more popular in Germany, yeah. thanks to the Schaubühne, than yeah. in France. That's an exception. It's really, it is an exception. But what I mean, and I heard that phrase once in London a couple of weeks ago, is that Germany, and I think it was Richard Sennett who said that, Germany is becoming a Kantian village, Immanuel Kant, in a world, in a Hobbesian world. Hobbesian, Hobbes, Hobbes. in a not a uh, sceptical, but a sceptical world. And a, a Kantian village in an Hobbesian world. Wow, I mean, I've been thinking about it, seeing all these builders, these very strong German builders, these very strong German theater texts and plays and films, etc. I like this kind of persons. And maybe I have to say that because I'm a Belgian, you know, we invented surrealism because we had to be porous. And, a uh, sewing machine and an iron board that's surrealism. But there was a moment, also in German culture, where there was a very strong flux of uh, surrealistic ideas. And it happened just before Die Wende and after Die Wende with a magazine, which I think is one of the ma best magazines, we called, it's called a German magazine for European thinking. And that's called Mercure. Mm -hmm. And it was so funny that Karl Heinz Böder, and Peschke, who were the founders, Peschke was the founder, and Karl Heinz Böder, were much more interested in surrealism than in Kant. And you learned that in Basel. Yeah. And I find it so interesting that, that we have some idiosyncratic, very original writers. I think Simon is one of them. And many writers of the Feuilletons, they have this kind of Peter Richter in the Süddeutsche, you should read him, Nicholas Mark in the FAZ, you should read him, Simon Strauss, of course. You have still a little bit of that notion of Paschke and Karl Heinz Böhler. You just have to reinforce it and you have to say, hey, we need these strong ideas. And that's my bad news of tonight, that we still have to do a lot of work. Ideas are never that's bad. All, that's <laughs> yeah. all I'm saying. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's, we live now with Merkel in the center of the center. And that's yeah. incredibly boring. When you said cars, <laughs> in, to live in the center of the center is incredibly boring. I mean, you know. And even the Greens, the Grüne, the Grüne in uh, Germany, they talk about the fact that they, they want to think about the car industry. Suddenly the Greens are going with it. Yeah. What's interesting now for you, especially in Holland, and that is the last thing I'm saying, is to follow a little bit the news of the past four days coming out of Germany, which is the reception of the problematics around the content, the ideas, and the forms of Joseph Beuys. And that's a very interesting discussion, how it's going back and forth, because it's dealing with this notion of who are we Germans and how do we deal today with this translation of our own culture, which is not an easy history mm -hmm. as we know it. Okay, can I so we should. Sorry, I thought, I mean, maybe you have a mic, so that helps. <laughs> yeah. No, uh, just because maybe you want to go home, but. Um, yeah. No, no, just shortly. Yeah, because. I, I think I can add something because I'm a cultural person. So mm -hmm. to be honest, I'm on the side of 
yeah, Simon good. Strauss. <laughs> yeah, because, mm -hmm. because my experience is completely different. When we start to travel with a theater in France, it was impossible for us to get in contact with the French people 20 years ago because they thought all Germans are Nazis. And I don't agree with you. So I, for me, I will never be proud to be a German. And I hope there will be not one generation after us to be proud of being a German. Mm -hmm. Because what the Germans did mm -hmm. is something that is unforgivable. And yeah. that we, has to, we have to face this. So, so to be you, proud of this country. What you want to do with this country? So you will I want deny to, I want to, deal with to be a German. I want to deal with the situation. For I, had, I had a big discussion with my parents. They said, why are the soccer players not singing the German hymn? Yeah, I'm I mean, sorry. I, 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 for me, the, it would be the best thing just to be for two minutes silent. I mean, I don't need any hymn. But this yeah. is not what I wanted to say. But, the thing but is, this is that really the bridge, an important the, the, discussion. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I know, I'm not I know. But the bridge, the bridge I, I'm is... I'm not from the, the right bridge, wing, you know? The bridge <laughs> that, that I found, the bridge that I found is <laughs> culture. But the, the reason kind why, of I'm accepted, why I'm in accepted, why, why, why I'm accepted now in, in Sweden, but why I'm accepted now in France, mm -hmm. in Great Britain, is because of culture. Because people go into a dialogue about culture. The reason why people travel mm -hmm. to a city like Berlin is culture, 100%. Culture means music, for example. Mm -hmm. Culture means maybe theater, not so strongly. One question. But this is the reason what, why the people the go there. What is the name of this and, culture? And, and How you name this culture? I, just, I said it. Just culture, not German culture. You cannot say German culture. What kind of culture? What this is my this is my question. Said, can when you, you be, talk I, about I this will culture? never be proud to be to no, but, call myself a German. But the interesting now. thing is that what culture. You, how, how you name it? You know, this is what I want to try to explain. Yeah. Uh, this is the confusion for the migrants. I want to uh, try to explain you as a German, original German. I'm a German too. I have the transcultural identity. I'm tur Kurdish, Turkish, and German, and. When I talk to especially left wings, I'm feminist, I was a house squatter, you know, I'm coming from the very left, you know. I, I'm not the kind of Nazi, I'm sorry, you know. When I say there's a, there's a problem saying I'm proud to be German, then I'm talking about what you say now. You are talking about this great culture in Berlin. I love Berlin, I'm a Berliner. There's big culture, yes, but you have difficulties to call it German culture. You will call it yeah, just because culture. Because I have, I have but, a big but, complex so of being a German. No, so, so I'm, 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 I have a big problem. Swing away. Swing away. Please come in. The interesting question is, does culture yeah. really has a language? What is the language of Hannah Arendt? What is the language of Beckett? What are Bach. the great, the great thing? I mean, no, I'm just... The interesting thing is that it touches people without oh. being on one you know, specific Stefan landscape. You know, Stefan Zweig suicide because he couldn't live in Germany. He suicide. I, 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 I had a quote from him in my book. Stefan Zweig has to die in, ex in, in, in exile. He couldn't co come back and he was, he was in love with uh, Austria and Germany. He wants to live there, but he couldn't live in this country. So for him, it's it was citizen, very important to have this choice uh, to come just to this thing, place to where he is. As a grown. citizen, of course, as a yeah. citizen, he felt German or Austrian yeah. or whatever. But he, he was very much interested in getting his work translated. Why? True. Because he thought that his stories are touching someone in America, in France as well. That is what he says culture, cu his cultural patriotism, yeah, no, no, his no, no, cultural no. patriotism, as we want to call it, is your, you talk about constitutional patriotism with Dolph Steinberger, he talks about cultural patriotism. And when I talk about Stefan Zweig, and you take St Stefan Zweig, he was really sad that somebody take away his home from him, yeah. you know, and I feel with him, and it hurts him, that he couldn't go back to his fatherland, how you call it, fatherland, you know? And he's thinking about fatherland. Nowadays, you know, so many people who cannot go back to Turkey. You know, I don't feel nationalist, you know? Nationalism is the worst thing what happened, you know? This is, I, I grown up in Berlin. I'm, I'm absolutely against this right-wing singing. But you deny this idea of what you say, we cannot swing away all this um, yeah. feeling of nation. There is a mixture of that in our century now. And we have to understand that people like me, we are sad. I'm, it hurts me and I'm crying that I cannot go to Turkey because there's a man who not allowed to come uh, back. 
this is, this is also my country. It hurts. And oh. I feel this culture, you know? This is what I try to say. You, f you have to feel a kind of culture of German, Netherlands, France, whatever. At the same time, yeah. we yeah, cannot hide behind culture. Yeah, this is because the, the culture is part of a very big mosaic, but yeah. we cannot hide behind it and saying, this is a Bruggehoofd, da gaat het om. It's much more complex today. Yeah. It's incredible <laughs> complex. No, and with Europe that is less complex. <laughs> Europe Everybody is less wants complex to go than home. I'm sorry. Than culture. No, <laughs> because said, I would say you say we can't hide behind culture. I would say we can't hide behind politics. So that's all. <laughs> no, <different>. no, we <laughs> need. <laughs> Thank you. And we cannot behind. We cannot hide behind time. Thank you so much. I mean, um, uh, uh, for this interesting sort of. Yeah, well, yeah, it was exactly the time. You, you didn't watch the time, but I did. Uh, thank you so much for this short panel. It was the choice of the organizers to, to get these keynotes and get your thoughts really uh, thoroughly on in, 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 in this evening and then a short panel discussion. Can I ask you to, 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 to take... Yeah. yeah, and let's take the chairs away because we're going to end the performance. Yeah, we're going to do it. I'm going to help. It's normally not the way it, it, it works in a concert, a concert gebouw, but it, work, it works this way in uh, venues like the Bali. <laughs> so it's okay. So, to, to close off this evening, in which we had all kinds of reflections on what is culture, what is the um, relationship between culture and politics. Um, is, it, is, it, is it the heart versus the rationality? Is it Hobbes versus Kant? Um, so we want to close off with something of the heart. And uh, Wende will perform two songs. And these songs uh, are from a new album, Mens, Human. And it's a per very personal album, a soul-searching, personal album. Um, and the songs are titled Hoe Lang Nog? And the second song is Blijf. Uh, Hoe Lang Nog is How Long Will It Last? And uh, Blijf uh, is translated to, to Stay. Um, it's, I'm gonna, we're going to end this evening with some beautiful music. Give her an applause. Venda. <laughs> Dat het zo stil kan zijn de nacht. Ik sta naar het plafond, ik wacht, geen zon. De kilte in mijn kop, de aarde draait, alles verstomt. Het kruipt, het gloeit in mij, de zwarte stroop. Een straffe knoop rondom mijn hart, verstrakt. En wil vernieling, weg van kracht. Het golft en gromt die binnenin, is het te laat. Wat is de zin? Alle gebreken stompen, dreunen, klauwen, snijden, maanden, weken. Alle gebreken stompen, dreunen, klauwen, snijden, maanden, weken. Hoe lang nog? Hoe lang nog? Hoe lang nog? Dat het zo stil kan zijn de nacht, ik sta naar het plafond, ik wacht geen zonde kilte in mijn kop, de aarde draait, alles verstomt. Het kruipt, het gloeit in mij, de zwarte strook, de straffe knoop rondom mijn hart verstrakt en wil vernieling weg van kracht. Het golft en grond die binnenin, is het te laat, wat is de zin? Alle gebreken, stompe dreunen, klauwen snijden, maanden, weken. Alle gebreken, stompe dreunen, klauwen snijden, maanden, weken. Hoe lang? 
De val dat vuile donker in, daar waar de geesten dwalen, waar het beest verhaal komt halen. Klaar om bot tot gruis te malen, brult me jij, gids zwart van eind. Wat doe jij nog, verdwijnt, is klaar, geef op, vergaven, stom. Ga weg, blijf weg, kom nooit weer op. Dag en nacht lachend ingedoken, handen vloeibaar uitgestoken, omarmd, verwarmd en lief gehad. Geloofd in jou en mij, in dat langs zon en maan gestormd, de hoop niet werd gebroken of verdomd. Genoeg gezegd en geprobeerd, elk woord een baksteen over weer. Krijg tijd gelijk, wat gaat, wat blijft. Is er iemand, zal er ooit nog iemand zijn? Is er iemand, zal er ooit nog iemand zijn? Alle gebreken stompen dreunen, klauwen snijden, maanden week. Alle gebreken stompen dreunen, alle gebreken stompen dreunen, klauwen snijden, maanden weken. Dat het zo stil kan zijn de nacht, ik sta naar het plafond. Ik wacht geen zonde kilte in mijn kop, de aarde draait, alles verstopt. Alle gebreken stompen dreunen, klauwen snijden, maanden week. Alle gebreken stompen dreunen, klauwen snijden, maanden weken. Hoe lang nog? Hoe lang nog? Hoe lang nog? Hoe lang nog? Thank you. It's true, it's a very personal album. <laughs> And uh, by asking myself um, how to be a human amongst other humans, uh, I had a lot more questions, but I had also a lot of answers, but the I think the most important answer was um, that I don't want to do it alone. <laughs> And um, I hope you had a, an enlightening evening. Thank you for being here. Um, And I want, please, a big applause also for my, my heroes and my musicians. And uh, it's Ludovic. <laughs> And Jan. Zoek mijn hand als alles blauw en ongrijpbaar lijkt. Geef je tranen als het gif van de angst. Door je lichaam snijdt, blijf, blijf bij mij als de winter langs je ruggen graat. Blijf bij mij als het vriezen in je botten kraakt, praat. Thank you. 
Gingen je dromen anders dan je hoopte, anders dan verwacht, zit je opgesloten. Open, blijf bij mij tot de lente door je lichaam breekt. Blijf bij mij tot de wind weer in je zeilen zweeft. Bende, if you want to see her, she will be performing uh, at the festivals this summer and she has a club tour uh, in, in the making. So please uh, check out online because uh, it's a beautiful uh, show. Thank you, uh, everybody, for being here. Um, tomorrow at 11 o'clock, uh, this festival continues. Here in het Concertgebouw, at 11 o'clock, you can hear the Dutch uh, Chamber Choir singing psalms. Yeah, well, what do you do on Sunday morning at 11? Uh, but it's, uh, to sh there are also uh, writers and it will show, reflect the richness of European culture. Um, you can also, faith in Europe, you can also go at four o'clock to the presentation of the Eurolab and um, uh, at the end in the Bali, a manifesto for the arts. Um, I hope uh, you will visit it or otherwise I wish you a fantastic weekend here. Uh, in Amsterdam. Thank you for showing up and attending this interesting seminar. Thank you. Speakers from Germany, thank you so much. And have a great evening. <laughs>